He says, how blessed is the man, first of all, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. David uses three words, walk, stand, sit, to tell us how the man who's truly happy lives his life. First he says that this happy man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now what does he mean by this? He means that someone who's found happiness, listen closely, refuses to listen to, to take the advice of, to base his behavior on the thinking of ungodly people. In other words, he rejects the secular and the humanistic viewpoints of people who don't know Christ. He refuses to base his life and his thinking on the opinions of men, the shifting opinions of men, who not only reject the word of God, but they embrace a philosophy of life that's contrary to the word of God. You see, this is where the unsaved go wrong. This is where, at times, believers go wrong and why they're not happy. It all starts with our thinking. What we think, the Bible says, is what we are. Listen very carefully. If you listen and believe the views of those who reject the word of God, even though you are surrounded by godly teachers and friends here, someday you are going to be thrust out of this college. And there's a world out there that does not embrace what you're being taught here. And if you listen and believe the views of those who reject the word of God, you will embrace a humanistic philosophy of life in which you are the center of the universe. Not Christ, but you. God and his glory are excluded from your, your life. See, when David speaks of those who are wicked, who give out counsel, he's not necessarily referring to those who live horribly decadent lives. He's talking about people who live as if God doesn't exist. That's, that's what he's talking about. They have no place for God in their thoughts, their daily lives. In fact, this Hebrew word for wicked or ungodly has the thought of restlessness in it. And that's just precious to know. It makes perfect sense because the ungodly are restless. They are unsettled in their thinking. Note that. They never arrive at any definite conclusion about anything. Are you okay? I am. Not bleeding. Yes, I'm okay. They never arrive at any definite conclusion about anything. They're, they're always changing their thoughts, their beliefs. Their, there's a mental restlessness that characterizes them. Concerning this restlessness, Martin Lloyd Jones, pastor, longtime pastor in London, said this The ungodly are necessarily restless because their knowledge is never final. They're always having to change their theories because something is discovered that disproves them. Such a man trusts his own wisdom, he trusts his own understanding, he trusts his own knowledge, so he has to admit that what was believed as science 50 years ago is now laughed at, as has happened throughout the centuries. And undoubtedly what is believed now will be laughed at 50 years from now. But the ungodly man still trusts human counsel. He trusts his own reason, his own investigations, his discoveries. He trusts himself, his own innate powers, and he dismisses God and everything that God represents. That is the ungodly person. Always restless, never, never arriving at any conclusion. They're unsettled because they're changing in their beliefs. And it's because they reject the unchanging word of God. And so they set their own standards. They live by their own rules. They determine their own set of ethics and morality. And what David is saying here is that those who are happy don't listen to people like that. They don't let the godless thinking of others shape the way they think and influence their view of life. And I want to stop here for a moment and think about how this, this applies to us. What you choose to think about who you choose to get advice from will determine whether you are a happy person in fellowship with Christ or not. So what is it that shapes your thinking? What is it? Or in the spirit of what David is teaching, what ungodly counsel do you refuse to listen to? What books and articles do you purposefully, purposefully avoid reading? What movies do you make sure you don't see? What television shows are you certain not to watch? What music do you refuse to listen to? 
Folks, these are the kinds of issues of life. This godly man made a choice. He refused to listen to the counsel of the ungodly. See, if you want to experience true happiness and joy in Christ, you have to make a conscious effort to refrain from walking in the counsel of the wicked. But that's not all. David continues to explain the way a godly person lives by saying something else about what he avoids, what he doesn't do. Notice how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand. Now he's talking about standing, such as walking and standing in the path of sinners. He doesn't do that. What does it mean to stand in the path of sinners? Well, to stand carries the thought of, of coming and taking one stand, of believing something, of embracing something, of acting upon something. To stand in the path of sinners means that you take your stand with unbelieving sinners, ungodly people, in the sense that you now do the same thing as they do. In other words, you just went from walking in the counsel of the ungodly where you listened to their errors, and now you stop. You stop, and you take your stand with them so that you live the same way they live. Having listened to them, now you are amongst them, standing with them for their values. To take your stand in the path of the ungodly is to practice an ungodly lifestyle. That's why there are believers who are not happy. Because there's some compromise in their lives. They're not living for Christ. And, and listen, sinful behavior never produces happiness. It deceives us into thinking that we can be happy and satisfying, but sinful behavior produces guilt, it produces conflicts with others, it produces anxiety, it produces broken relationships, it produces anger, and hostility, but it never produces true, genuine happiness. Sin is very deceptive. Being a pastor over 30 years, I have seen so many married couples deceived into thinking that if they only got a divorce and had somebody else as their partner, they would be happy. They're deceived. They have heeded the ungodly counsel of the wicked. They have stopped, and they're standing in the way of the wicked. It, it'll never give you happiness. Listen, you may be a believer in, in the Lord Jesus, but there's no joy in your life, and there's a reason for that. If you are behaving, if you are thinking like an unbeliever, you will never, never have true happiness. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, the time has come... And it's past for you to behave this way. If you're a Christian, there's a new way of life, a new way of thinking. But there's something else that David tells us that the ungodly, or the godly man rather, doesn't do. David says he doesn't walk in the counsel of the, of the wicked, he doesn't stand in the path of sinners, nor does he sit in the seat of the scoffers. This godly person does not sit down in the seat of scoffers. Now what does he mean by that? Well, to sit suggests a permanent seat. It implies a settled conviction now of the heart. And what kind of settled conviction is David talking about? He calls it the seat of the scoffers, of mockers. Watch this. It's the settled conviction and heart attitude of those who scoff and mock at the holy standards of the word of God. That's where this all leads. One Bible teacher explained who scoffers are with these words. He said, they are the people who stick out their tongues at everything that is sacred and holy and sanctified. They are the clever people who laugh at religion and joke at it, who scoff at God and his law and his ordinances, who scoff at all the sanctities in life, marriage, morality, and decency. Let me put it this way. They are the Hollywood comedians of late night TV who think that everything you and I believe in is a joke. Scoffers are never happy people. They live empty lives. They, nothing is sacred to them. Nothing they believe in is worth living for or dying for. So they laugh and joke about God, the Bible, Christians, anything that is decent and holy. So David is, has told us that this man, this godly man refuses all of that. He refuses to listen to what ungodly people say and embrace it. He refuses to take his stand with them and behave like them. And he refuses to sit down and say, this is my conviction. Now, before we move on to discover what positive things this 
this man did that made him so happy. I want to say something important about how to avoid ending up like this. See, there are many Christians who are unhappy. They, as I said, they know Christ as Savior, but they lack joy and peace in their lives. And why is that? It's because somewhere along the line you have compromised the truth of Scripture that you have not repented of. And that small compromise may have started out small, but it leads to straying away from the truth. The Bible speaks about certain individuals who, frankly, if Scripture didn't tell us that they were believers, nobody would ever know it. Nobody would ever know it because they live such compromising lives. For example, I'm thinking of Samson. If you look at Samson's life, and this man loved foreign women, his own sinful lust led to his downfall, and yet the writer to the Hebrews counts him amongst the men and women of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. Who knew that this was a man of faith? Well, because he didn't live like that. I think of also Lot, Abraham's nephew, who Peter, in his second letter, identifies him, and I quote, as righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the sensual conduct of the sinful men of Sodom, and his soul was tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. But, but you read about Lot, and Peter didn't tell us that he was a righteous man. He'd say, no way, because he's a compromiser. He chose a life of compromise because he selfishly chose to live amongst the ungodly people of Sodom, thinking that the land would make a profit for him. So listen. Both Samson and Lot strike me as unhappy men who chose to, to compromise God's truth and they paid a dear price for it. They ended up messing up their lives. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Don't do it. How can you avoid their mistakes? You avoid falling as far as they fell by refusing to make even the slightest compromise in your life. The way you think, the way you, you live. Nobody ends up Listen, nobody ends up standing in the way of sinners or sitting in the seat of the scoffers overnight. There's a downward slide that begins by making some small compromise in the way you think. Perhaps some rationalization, some justification for sinful thinking or behavior. And it pushes you to violate more and more of the word of God. Maybe something unethical, maybe something immoral. Whatever it is that's wrong, it will lead to a downward path to the point where you are so unhappy. So the key to avoiding this is make sure that you don't allow any compromise to enter your life, not even a small one. And if you have already, then you repent of it. You confess your sin, and Christ's blood covers it. So David has told us what this godly man does not do. But what does he do? That's not even easy to say. It sounds silly. What does he do? He does something that makes him happy. He tells us in verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. What precious words. Listen, instead of listening to and heeding what the ungodly base their lives on, David tells us that the secret of this godly man's happiness is that he listens to the law of the Lord. And more than he listens to it, he delights in it, and he meditates upon it day and night. This man is genuinely happy, and part of that reason is because he delights in the law of God. By law, David does not mean just the Ten Commandments. He means what we would call the Bible, the whole revelation of God. That's what made this man so happy. He has an unchanging standard that he follows, not like the restless views of the ungodly. He knows that what he believes is true, and that God loves him. And what God has written is in his best interest and will guide him all of his days. He doesn't listen to the opinions and speculations of men, knowing that they have no authority, that they change all the time. So he has chosen to base his life upon divine truth, which is unchanging, it's clear, and it's for his own good. I want you to notice something important, how this man looked upon God's word. Notice that David tells us he delights in the law of the Lord. He delights in it. See, many of us, we, we appreciate the Bible. We read our Bibles. We may be very diligent. I hope you are in our daily devotions. Spend time in the Word, time in, in prayer. But sometimes that can become very mechanical, sort of a checkoff that we do. Okay, that's what I had to do today. I, I read my, my passage. I can move on. That's not how this man was. 
Spending time in the Word was not a burden to him. It wasn't something that he just needed to do. It wasn't an obligation. It was a desire. If you don't have this desire, you need to ask God for it. You need to ask God for it. You need to ask the Lord to give you an appetite for the Word of God. And I can tell you, if you don't have an appetite for the Word of God, why you don't? Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, therefore, putting aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, slander, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Why did Peter say put off all these sinful attitudes and then have an appetite for the word of God? Then long for it. Because if there's sin, unconfessed sin in your life, these attitudes in particular, you will not have an appetite for scripture. It's like taking junk food. If you take junk food, when dinner is served to you, if you're feeding on junk food all day, you're not going to want a good, nutritious meal. It's the way it is with the Word of God. So if you've lost your appetite, passion for God's Word, if you don't delight in it, where it's more important to you than anything else, then there's something wrong in your life. That's true in my life. There's something wrong in my life. You need to confess it and need to ask the Lord to give us that hunger for the Word of God. So this godly man delights in the word. He takes pleasure in it. He loves it. He esteems it. He tells us later in the Psalms even more than, than food and money. Because he holds God's word in such high regard. Instead of listening to the counsel of the ungodly, David tells us here in verse 2, this man notices he doesn't only delight in the word of God. It leads him to meditate day and night on the law of the Lord. So what does that mean to meditate day and night? Let me tell you first of all what it does not mean. It does not mean to give a few minutes each day to read your Bible. As important as that is, and I set aside time to read the Word, and I think that's important. And even though I'm studying for two sermons almost every week, I still need to just read the Word. But that's not what David is talking about. No, David says that this godly man meditates on the Word day and night. This isn't a few minutes a day he spends on the Word. This is something that's going on all the time. It means day and night and in between. He meditates on the Word of God throughout the day, not a particularly set time of the day. He doesn't say, this is my time to meditate. This is his lifestyle throughout the day. Listen carefully, because what you're about to hear may very well alter the course of your life. The Hebrew word that's translated meditates has the basic meaning of murmuring or muttering to yourself. You see, in ancient times, the Bible wasn't readily accept, accessible to God's people. They didn't go to a bookstore and just purchase it. So they would memorize portions of the word and then think about it and reflect on it by murmuring or muttering these divine words out loud in a low voice. One Hebrew scholar explained meditating on the word this way. He said the spiritual discipline of meditation begins with the memorization of divine instruction so that along the way, by day or in the or, or on your bed at night, you could recall it and think about it. This hiding of God's word in the heart also requires gaining a full understanding of it. Then one can speak to God about the word, turning its thoughts and concerns into prayer. And finally, meditation concludes with self-exhortation, rebuking yourself, exhorting yourself, encouraging yourself, as when the psalmist says things like, why are you cast down on all my soul? It's talking to yourself in the Word. The meditation is fixed in the mind. And we mutter, ladies and gentlemen, that's what will make one happy. So if you want to be happy, then according to David, you have to cultivate this discipline. It doesn't come naturally. You've got to cultivate the right thinking. Force your mind to concentrate on the truths of Scripture. It doesn't mean you don't think about anything else during the day, but it does mean that in those moments of lull, this is what you think about, the Word of God. Even saying them out loud, slowly, or others will think you're crazy. But murmuring to, to yourself, mulling them over in your mind, absorbing them to the point where they impact the way you live. Now, that is why this man was so happy. And did he have a productive life? Well, we don't have time to go into it, but it, it says that, yes, 
It says in, in verse 3, he's like a tree, firmly planted by the stream of water. He is nourished. His life is productive. It counts for something. And then he will live forever. His destiny is to live with Christ forever in glory. Listen, we want your lives to count. We want you to be Christ-like, happy people. This is the key. That's why I said Psalm 1 sets the tone for this, all the Psalms. May God take his word, apply it to your lives, and may we be doers of the word starting today in applying this and be the kind of happy people the Lord wants you to be. Let's back to prayer. Father, thank you for this precious psalm. May it impact us, Lord. May our thinking be different. May we refuse to heed godless counsel. May we not act like unbelievers act. And may we certainly not have the attitude of ridiculing the sacred truths of Scripture. Lord, I pray for every student here, every faculty member. I pray for myself. Help us to have an appetite for the Word. To not just appreciate it, not even to just love it, but to delight in it. May this excite us more than anything else. More than for those of us who love sports, may this excite us more, your Word. For those of us who are always looking up financial stuff, may this, your word, excite us more than that. May your truths be the delight to our hearts. May we meditate day and night, Lord. Fill our minds with your word, Lord, that we would be the kind of people who not only are happy, but who bring glory to you. I pray this, we pray this, all in Christ's name.